You all may be surprised to see me in disputatio <laughs> delivering a talk from a manuscript. It's true. I have not used a manuscript since I was a freshman at New St. Andrews when my dear rhetoric teacher, Dr. Schlecht, at the time just a jolly young optimistic fellow, not the hardened veteran you know today, <laughs> gently suggested that after one of my presentations that I should maybe not use a manuscript like ever again. <laughs> at the time, I took his advice and never looked back. But a few days ago, the self-same Dr. Schlecht saw me in the halls and said, hey Tim, are you gonna use a manuscript on Friday? I replied, no way. I'll probably just shoot from the hip or have some vague talking points and make some stuff up. He said, I think you should use a manuscript <laughs> and deliver a manifesto. And so I'm taking his advice again and I am delivering a language manifesto. Yeah, I know that's not that funny, it's kind of scary. <laughs> Furthermore, Dr. Longshore, when he asked me to give a talk at Disputatio in the first place, said I should make it spicy and controversial and not to pull any punches. So behold, <laughs> this is Mr. Griffith at Disputatio delivering a spicy manifesto <laughs> on languages from a manuscript. I hope this will make everyone happy. For Christians, language holds a unique importance. John tells us in the beginning was the Word, referring to the second person of the Trinity. In Genesis, God spoke the world into existence. God communicated his will to Moses at Sinai in the form of the written Word on two tablets. And then he communicated his inspired Word to all Israelites' uh, people in the form of the Hebrew Scriptures. And eventually, he communicated the new covenant to Greek and Jew alike through the apostles in the form of written Greek. Christians rightly have been called the people of the word and the people of the book. The first example of work that God gave Adam in the garden was to name animals. And whatever Adam called the animal, that is what it was. The first human task was specifically a linguistic activity, coming up with names and categories for the animals. It wasn't a biology task. God didn't have Adam kill the animals, soak them in formaldehyde, and then take them apart to see how their bits worked. <laughs> no, dissecting cats is something that comes after the fall. <laughs> and also notice that the first task given to mankind also had nothing to do with music. Music is only first mentioned in Genesis 4.21 as the invention of Jubal, a descendant of Cain, <laughs> who is called the father of all that play the flute. I, I kind of feel bad about that one now that his harm is hurt. Um, <laughs> it makes sense that language was the first act of dominion. The first step of taking dominion of anything is to understand it. And understanding something necessarily requires language because language is what gives form to our thoughts. Language is the vehicle for our thoughts. Try to have a thought without putting it into words, even in the privacy of your own head. You can't do it. A language incarnates the categories of the mind. If Adam was gonna rule the beasts, he needed to understand them and so he needed to have names for them. The same is true for every task that we do as humans. The first step in doing any work is to learn the terminology. You want a farm? Okay, this is a field, this is a seed, etc. But it is more interesting than this. Not only is language the vehicle for thought, but different languages cause thoughts to take different shapes and different forms. A language describes the world and everything in it sort of like a giant jigsaw puzzle. Each irregularly shaped piece is a word that signifies a certain amount of reality in the world. But in different languages, the world is the same, but the pieces are different. In Hebrew, there are only about 2,000 pieces. 
and they're big and weirdly shaped. <laughs> In Greek, they're about 60,000 pieces, and they're still weirdly shaped. In Latin, they're the perfect number of pieces, okay, with very pleasant and enlightening shapes. When a person thinks in a language, the number and shape of particular pieces make a huge difference. It constantly controls what you think of as the same or similar and what you think of as different or unlike. And this changes everything. To a degree, you can even tell how a culture thinks simply by looking at its vocabulary. The most famous example of this is that Eskimos have nine words for snow. What does that tell you? It tells you that snow is an important part of their life. And the distinctions between different kinds of snow matter to them because they need to think and speak about these distinctions. They need more words for them. This is true of every language on every topic. So to summarize, language gives form to thoughts. A specific language affects the specific structure and categories of the thoughts that can take shape. This is the order of things from creation itself. To work as humans in the real world, we must be able to think about the world, and we must have the language to allow us to shape those thoughts in useful ways. This is why language itself is not just central, but first in education. So what does that mean? Does that actually mean we must learn a foreign language? Why not just pour ourselves into English? Isn't English a sufficient language? It has a huge vocabulary, and it's been the lingua franca of the world for over a couple centuries. The English uh, language is a great language indeed, but it became so by influence with French and Latin. Before Alfred, what, you could, what could you actually talk about in English? Farming, sailing, chainmail, axes, Normans, Danes, we can see traces of the pre-Latin English by the monosyllabic derivatives of Old English that remain in our language. Pig, ax, dung. <laughs> no. It was the translation of ideas from Latin during Alfred's reign, even their precious riddles, that made English take a step up. Then, the influx of French beginning with the Norman invasion. Then again, during the 16th century from Latin, when people were beginning to use English to produce works of theology, philosophy, and literature for the first time. At the end of this transformation, English stands with no less than 85% of its vocabulary derived from Latin in some way. So what? History's bunk. Now we have English. Just because it came from other languages at one point doesn't matter, us, uh, matter to us anymore, does it? On the contrary, Languages don't always get better. Vocabularies don't always grow. Sentence structures do not always become more subtle, more versatile, more capable of communicating thought clearly, powerfully, and beautifully. Even the greatest languages will languish if the speakers of it are not regularly fed on a diet of great literature and great languages. Look at the high Middle Ages. Latin, which itself had become a powerful language, through its interaction with Greek in the first century BC and had become the most successful language in history, even Latin, through centuries of being cloistered up with wifeless men, with small libraries and bad hygiene, languished. It languished to the point of producing authors such as Thomas Aquinas, <laughs> whose lifeless, simplistic prose, some even call it Latin, myself, I would call it pigeon Latin, <laughs> a small step up from pig Latin, <laughs> actually deigns to use infinitives as the object of a preposition. <laughs> After modern English was forged by true greats, such as Shakespeare, Marlowe, Moore, Milton, Dunn, Dryden, whose greatness was only derivative from their readings of Homer, Virgil, Ovid, Horace, Cicero, Seneca, and the like. It was necessary to maintain it through regular interaction with Latin and Greek. Roger Ascham, Queen Elizabeth's tutor, at the end of the 16th century in his book, The Skullmaster, it's spelled like that, 
laid out a new program of education based on double translation for the English elite classes in which schoolboys would spend most of their wretched, wretched day <laughs> translating the Latin greats into English and then proceeding to translate it back into the original Latin as precisely as possible. The, Britain, the British called this doing your Latins throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. It's likely that Ascom is primarily responsible for killing Latin through this method, <laughs> but he actually did a lot for English. The British and later the American elites were so used to the vocabularies and grammatical structures of the Latin originals that the English language became deeply imbued with the spirit of Latin at the cost of those young schoolboys. Um, <laughs> So much so that the English prose of authors such as John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, who himself probably never had the opportunity to study Latin, are manifestly deeply Latinate. In the 19th century, Booth Tarkington, who wrote the Penrod stories, had failed to get his degree from Princeton because he was unable to complete his Latin requirements. And yet, if you read his prose, much of his sentence structure and vocabulary choice looks like it was written by Cicero. Even a Latin flunky was possessed by the spirit of Latin as he wrote English about American rural life. Latin had trickled down into the English of everyday Englishmen and Americans. However, as impressive as English became, it is now in marked decline and has been so for almost 200 years. When elite schools stopped studying the classical languages in the mid 19th century in favor of more practical subjects, English immediately began to become simpler. Sentences shrank and became less varied. Although technical vocabularies in modern English are bigger than ever, the general vocabularies of both elites and common people have become smaller. Go on Google Books and find a copy of any personal letter written by a farmer or a teenager in the 19th century and read it. If you can make out their cursive, you will immediately notice how eloquent their prose appears. Their sentences were long, joined together with subordinate clauses and participial phrases. Their vocabulary was precise and varied. They demonstrate a copiousness that not many people today could replicate. Their personal letters often contained a complexity that we only see in academic prose today. Only it actually had soul and communicated real meaning <laughs> to real ordinary people. <laughs> if you look at the literature written in that, people, uh, in that period, you will see the same, but even more so. In fact, we have to take classes in school to understand English literature that was at one time actually popular among common people. Regular people used to read these things during their leisure time of their own volition. We have to consult spark notes to know what they were saying and take quizzes to make sure we really understood. When we make film adaptations of Jane Austen for a popular audience, we have to simplify her language so we can follow the plot. When we make film adaptations of Shakespeare's plays, the actors have to compensate for the language by overacting everything. And the writers add ridiculous gags, such as having characters pretend to ride on horses, but not really, or adding random, random flatulence. So the audience knows when to laugh. Why do they do this? Because nobody but Shakespeare scholars actually knows what the characters are saying half the time. English is reverting slowly to the simplistic language it was before classical languages made it great. Now, someone will object. Don't we have examples of great literature written in English in the 20th century after the decline of Latin in the schools? What about Orwell, Auden, Tolkien, Charles Williams, Lewis, Sayers, T.S. Eliot? Yes, yes, these authors have written some truly great works. But did Orwell study Latin in school? Yes, in fact, he did. Auden, yes. Tolkien, well, he probably knew more Latin by the time he was 12 than almost any doctor of classics today, not to mention Greek and other things. <laughs> 
How about Charles Williams? Yes, he did too. Lewis? He was very well versed in Latin and Greek and even wrote a series of letters in excellent Latin to an Italian priest who didn't know any English. Sayers? Well, she didn't know it very well, but she did study it for 20 years. Okay. Her methodology was flawed, but at least she tried. But is their knowledge of Latin actually evident in their great works? In many cases, it is very evident. Tolkien crafted the greatest epic of our time and went to great lengths to make it English through and through. And yet, if you look at his work carefully, you'll find that his marvelously original work is a reworking of models from Homer and Virgil. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, Space Trilogy, Until We Have Faces, all of his fiction, draw heavily on the works of Apuleius, Ovid, and Phaedrus. Without his Latin education, you probably wouldn't have read any Lewis at all. But in the decline of the English language, even many of these works from just a few decades ago are becoming too difficult for us to read without the structure of a class and the coercion of a teacher. To say nothing of the general population, many new St. Andrews students find Tolkien the Virgil of our age and our mother tongue too daunting to read and instead prefer to coddle their brains with the easy images and sounds of Peter Jackson's <laughs> dumbed down, de-Christianized, de-poetrized secular monstrosity. <laughs> and so they cast aside a gem from their own inheritance of English literature and leave Tolkien's works unread, unknown, neglected, in favor of a director of horror films who grew up on a steady diet of Dungeons and Dragons and Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> okay, I'm done. All right. <laughs> the study of Latin is a hallmark of the best authors who write in English. Even many of the most notable popular English authors of our time studied it, Terry Pratchett, J.K. Rowling, Suzanne Collins, to name a few. Okay, you say, that's literature. But what about the spoken word? You'll find that the same is true. The most well-spoken and effective orators of our time also studied Latin. Theodore Roosevelt, Margaret Thatcher, Boris Johnson, and Winston Churchill. Where do you think all that eloquence came from? We probably won World War II because of the study of Latin in England. The Germans certainly started it in part because they stopped studying liberal arts and humanities and classical languages in general and decided to raise a generation of STEM specialists who were very good at building machines and figuring out how to blow things up, but forgot who they were and where they came from and the difference between right and wrong. I digress again. The English language was truly magnificent. The study of classical languages made it so and kept it so for centuries. It is less magnificent now, but it is still pretty good. Let's keep it good and do our part to stem its decline. Let's go further and actually strive to restore it to its former glory with a regular study of classical languages and literature. If you love English, then you ought to be a good steward of it. Study Latin, and if you still have time, study some Greek too. We are not, however, just citizens of the US uh, or England or Canada. We are citizens of the kingdom of God and our loyalties go back further. Our people began in a different time in archaic languages. Our mother tongue may be English, but our grandmother tongue is Latin and our great grandmother tongues are Greek and Hebrew. I think we all recognize the importance of studying history. Those who do not learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat the stupid mistakes in history and to miss the opportunities of following the great successes in history. But we, we, what we forget sometimes is that in history, we mostly learn what people have done and how it turned out. But when we read ancient literature in the original languages, we listen to the very voices of our forefathers. Through thinking their words after them, we learn how they thought about the world. We learn to think in their terms, in their categories, in the structures of their own thoughts. And not just on the big ideas that we cover in philosophy classes, 
and usually don't understand anyway. We hear and see their thoughts on every topic, battle, clothing, food, housing, power, love, virtue, vice, good, evil, beauty. And sometimes we see that they thought very differently than we do today on those topics. And sometimes we see that they thought just like we do on those topics. And when we learn to follow their thoughts and think differently, we learn something. Aha, maybe there is something to the way they looked at it. I never considered that aspect of it before. Or, oh, so that's why so-and-so and such-and-such -and -such a work says such-and-such -such a thing. I now understand what he was saying. And when we see that they thought of things just like we do, we also learn something. Maybe there really is something to this idea, since people have been talking exactly like this for two millennia. Maybe we aren't crazy to talk and think this way. Maybe our predecessors did understand our current problems, and maybe they have something useful to say about how to solve them. Someone who knows only one language only knows the world from a single perspective. He views things from a single set of categories and can only articulate his thoughts through a single medium. Someone who knows two languages sees the same world from two slightly different perspectives. It's like having two eyes instead of just one. Together, your eyes can see an object more fully because they see slightly different aspects of the same object. Even knowing a modern foreign language has this effect. The more foreign the language, the more dramatic the effect. Someone who knows Spanish will tell you how Spanish views things a little differently. But in the grand scheme of things, Spanish is very close to English, and the difference in perspective is not that large. They are both fairly recent languages, born in Europe, based in word order, and built on a foundation of Latin. Spanish just has a different barbarian influence than English. <laughs> but someone who knows Mandarin will have a very different perspective on the world. Their categories, baked into their language, are very different from our own. Ask Mr. Pinkle how Chinese would view any given concept, whether mundane or profound, and unless the concept is very recent, it is almost sure to be very different from our own way of thinking. This is why we don't get their sense of humor, and they don't get ours. Our categories are so different that we find different things funny. This also may be why Mr. Pinkle doesn't think your papers are very funny. <laughs> Too much time in those categories. But when you learn an ancient language, especially one like Latin or Greek, the perspective isn't just one different from our own. It is also historical. Our own way of thinking in English was built on the model of Latin and Greek thoughts, and learning their way of viewing the world cast light on all of our own literature and institutions, the high and the low. Learning a very foreign language like Mandarin will certainly help you see the world in a different light, Learning Latin or Greek will help you understand who we are as heirs of the Western tradition, where we came from, and why we speak and think the way we do. Most importantly, as Christians, we are people of the word and people of the book. The word, that word and that book, took shape in the form of Greek and Hebrew and partly under the rule of a Latin-speaking people. Thus, learning to see the world as the Romans and Greeks did is extremely helpful in understanding the scriptures themselves as the immediate audience did. Although it's a wonderful thing that the scriptures have been translated for us into modern English, the process of translation itself is necessarily a reorganization and a recategorization of the original ideas, even when it's spot on. I'm not just talking about the living Bible or the word, this applies even to the King James Version. Does this mean that we don't have real access to the scriptures? No. Does this mean that we often misunderstand what the scriptures are saying? In some places, yes. Inasmuch as you cannot think in the same categories and structures of thought as the original, there will be both incorrect loss and incorrect gain in your interpretation of the scriptures. Think about what you thought a particular passage meant when you were a kid. 
and how when you grew up and read the same passage again, you realized that it wasn't quite what you originally thought. When you read the Bible in the original languages, this happens all the time. Do we need to worry about our salvation because we read the Bible in English? Translation, no. The Lord knows his people are mostly language flunkies and arranged accordingly for the Bible to be redundant in so many ways that the word is preserved through all times and all languages. Thank the Lord. <laughs> but now more than ever, when the world has changed so drastically and our categories for the world have shifted equally as much, it is critical that we actively pursue an understanding of the thought system found in the ancient literature. When Christ says, love your enemy, did he mean hostem or an amicum? When the proverb says, it's not good for a man to eat too much honey, glory. What does that even mean? We learn those things by learning classical languages and learning them for real. So if learning classical languages is so important, how do we deal with the reality that we are really not very good at it? In many classical Christian schools today, students study Latin for years and years and years and never get to the point where they can read original text. Even here at New St. Andrews, the results are varied. After one year, some students are able to access Virgil, Ovid, and Apuleius directly, but even then, it's with quite a lot of work. Nobody is reading these texts with what anyone would call ease. Some students are able to read much smaller selections from Phaedrus, again, laboriously. Some students are able to articulate complicated thoughts in classical languages, albeit slowly and usually with some errors. Other students just nod and say, ita, a lot. <laughs> I know, I know. So is this what success looks like? Are some students reaping the benefits of classical languages and others not? The first answer to this is that no matter what you do in life, the results will be varied. I like to use the parable of the sower to illustrate this point, even though, of course, that's not what the parable was about. A sower, that is, a language teacher, goes out in the field and starts casting seed, like, Latin or Greek. A small part of it falls on hard ground. Think a student who finds the whole world boring. Yes, nothing's going to grow from that. A small part of it gets eaten up by some birds, maybe video games or social media or something. That seed doesn't go anywhere. Some of it gets strangled by weeds. Think health and financial constraints or drama with family or roommates. Yes, that can cut growth off. But the majority of the seed takes root and grows and produces fruit. But even there, the results are varied. Some students get a 30-fold yield, some 60, and some 100. But it isn't just the ones who make it to reading original text that get a yield. If students are learning to enter the ancient world through its own words and thoughts, they are developing an ancient perspective and one that matters to us historically. That will bear fruit in how they read, write, and understand all areas of life. The second answer to this is simply that we need to continue to get better at teaching classical languages. You will notice that from the beginning to the end of this Griffith Manifesto, I've been talking about how languages are vehicles for thought, and learning an ancient language is to learn ancient categories and ancient structures to convey and interpret thoughts. This has rarely been understood well, and this misunderstanding or lack of understanding has resulted in some very ineffective pedagogy in the classroom. As a result, many students have spent quite a few years in the Latin penitentiary, so to speak, without coming out the other side enlightened. So what's going on? Well, first of all, there is a practical obstacle. We simply don't have enough teachers who actually know the classical languages. When the teacher doesn't know the language and doesn't have the means or desire to learn it, the class invariably ends up being about something other than actually learning the language. Students chant some stuff, push some stuff around in their workbooks, but in the end, nobody really learns much. <laughs> 
My hope is that New St. Andrews graduates will be able to help turn the tide in this area, and they are already beginning to do so. Second, the world of Latin, uh, not Latin, the world of classical uh, language pedagogy is in disarray. Most teachers of classical languages fall into one of two camps, each of which is an extreme ideology. The first camp is the grammar translation camp, who believe that they are traditionalists and are doing things the good old fashioned way. But in reality, they use a method that's no older than the invention of the automobile or the harnessing of electricity. These teachers present language as a list of abstract rules or forms with English equivalents that must be memorized and reproduced, but not used in any meaningful way to convey or interpret the thought directly. In doing so, they make a critical mistake in their approach to language. They believe that you can translate first using a series of rules and then understand by reading what they've translated. To put it a different way, they think you can translate into English before you know what the text means. Then once you've finished translating it, you can read what you wrote and be enlightened on the meaning. This is a fundamental misunderstanding of both how language means anything at all and what real translation is. Real translation is interpreting a particular thought in a particular context, a thought that's been enfleshed in one language. Once interpretation has occurred, you can proceed to hunt around for the English word or words to communicate a similar idea with a similar effect. So in real translation, comprehension comes first and then translation follows. If you do it the other way around, you're just filling out an elaborate paint by numbers coloring page. Every time you see the right prompt, you follow the rubric and replace it with the prescribed replacement. This isn't reading a language. And this isn't really translation. When students are required to do this in schools, they can be translating Virgil and never be moved whatsoever by some of the greatest poetry ever written. They aren't moved because they never got it. It's an exercise in turning great literature into bad English. They might as well just use chat GPT. It'll decode the message better, and just like the student, it will feel nothing. <laughs> and now that chat GPT is around, that's exactly what most of these students will be doing. Are there examples of people, though, who have successfully learned this way? Actually, yes. The human mind is a marvelous thing. Some students are so smart with language, so persistent, they spend so much time in the language that they begin to read by context and see, the past, see past the rigid replacements. This represents fewer than 5% of students. And frankly, if you had left these same students on a deserted island with a library of Latin and Greek books for a few decades, they would have figured it out anyway. They usually become classics professors, but can't seem to teach anyone else how to understand the language. The second camp is a hippie movement that originated in the 70s. It really is. Often called the natural method. Kind of everything in the 70s is the natural method. <laughs> it belongs with other 70s ideas like water birthing. And the other. These teachers want to teach students Latin the same way that they learned their native tongue, by total immersion. So they only speak in Latin or Greek or Hebrew from the moment they first see their students to the day years later when their students finally escape their language requirement, very relieved, but usually not very well educated. Since their students can't understand what they're saying, these teachers become proficient mimes and dance around the room until their students have a vague idea of what's going on. Ooh, ooh, you're climbing a ladder. In a process they call comprehensive input, the students sit in silence and in theory, just soak it all in, just like little babies soak in the language spoken by their parents and siblings. The trouble with this method is not that total immersion doesn't work. It does work. But in order for it to work, it requires real immersion, like real Baptist immersion. <laughs> not a gentle Presbyterian sprinkling. <laughs>
One teacher cannot immerse 20 students, especially in, 20, in 45 minutes a day. One teacher can immerse one student in three or four hours a day, especially if they aren't cooped up in a classroom and can talk about real things in the real world. Do some people nevertheless learn this way successfully in the classroom? Yes, they do. But again, it's just 5%. These students usually are sneaking a peek at a grammar book while the teacher isn't looking. So what is the proper method? Well, a mixture of both as well as a dose of common pedagogical sense. The grammar translation people aren't wrong that comparing English words and grammar to similar ones in Latin or Greek can be very useful. The problem is that that's all they ever do. They, are not, uh, they do not allow the classical language to be a language that conveys real thoughts directly. Students should use the language to say stuff and they should begin by reading texts simple enough that they can understand them without decoding. Likewise, the comprehensible input people are not wrong that comprehensible input is an important part of language acquisition. However, they are wrong to not have their students produce the language, comprehensible output, from day one. They are right to give their students easy texts, but they are wrong to interpret those texts for the students by acting them out. The teacher's job is to teach the student to learn to interpret themselves, not to provide a song and dance show. Immersive exercises are important, but they are not sufficient on their own. What I am saying is not new at all. This is the well-proven way to teach classical languages. Quintilian talks about acquiring language through both theory and imitation. Throughout the Middle Ages, Latin education was a combination of both total immersion and grammatical study. Erasmus and Vives and Cordarius and others in the Reformation approved of a combination of both grammatical instruction and copious immersive examples. Comenius in the 17th century teaches with both grammar and gradual and systematic introduction of examples. Along similar lines, W.H.D. Roos in the 20th century perfected a method of combining grammar with the gradual introduction to examples. And also in the 20th century, Hans Orberg wrote a textbook that follows these same principles. And even in the 70s, despite all the natural stuff going on, a famous Latin teacher named Paul Disler was doing the same thing. In short, students need a balanced diet of grammatical instruction and using the language to interpret and communicate thoughts. That is how you teach students to think in another language. And that is what allows them to commune with original authors and to laugh at the funny parts, be scandalized at the awkward parts, and be grossed out by the overly vivid parts. In conclusion, it is a huge blessing that we can study classical languages in our time. It is central to our educational mission. If you have the time and ability and opportunity to learn classical languages, do it. And don't do it in a silly, ineffective way. Thank you. So if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Okay. okay. So one thing that a lot of us, like, I'm sure all have a similar situation, going back home and having to explain or answer questions about why it's Latin, um, and people who are probably more unfamiliar with these concepts. So what would be a good way to kind of summarize everything you said in a way for Right, that's a fantastic question. Uh, the question is, yeah, but I'm gonna go home and they're gonna say, why are you studying Latin? Why are you wasting your time doing something impractical? And they don't have time for a manifesto. Okay, super important question. And this is something that, um, that teachers in classical Christian schools have to deal with all the time. And the reality is people who are asking that question aren't having a good time in Latin or their kids aren't having a good time in Latin and they want you to give an answer in 30 seconds or less, okay? And I think the best strategy is you need to find out what is compelling to them. Okay, so there are a million reasons to study something like Latin or Greek. You just need to answer them with the simple answer that actually scratches the itch 
that they have in 30 seconds. So for example, if I'm talking to a doctor and they say, why are we studying Latin? I say, I'm not gonna give them all that spiel. I'm just gonna say, um, because if you do, you learn all the anatomy and you have an easy time taking your MCAT. They're like, oh, that's a great reason, excellent. <laughs> okay, because you really can't win unless you just um, give them an answer that is short like that. And you say, and there's lots of other benefits too. Um, you know, and then another person, um, you know, it could be a little bit of an eat your spinach sort of answer. Like they're all into virtue and doing hard things. And you say, Latin, Latin is CrossFit, but for your mind, <laughs> okay? And they're like, oh my goodness, I totally am into that. I love it, okay? Um, so um, I really do think because they're only gonna give you 30 seconds, you need to know your audience and all of those things are true. Okay, Latin is CrossFit for your mind, okay? With fewer injuries. Well, <laughs> a few fewer injuries. Okay, um, but it's just a matter of you're gonna have to give a civil answer. Great question, anything else? Uh, over here. You mentioned that English was kind of a lame language before we started really putting out the categories into it. I didn't use the word lame, but go ahead. <laughs> so what made Latin itself such a great language Greek. Greek. Yes. No, it's it's not even really about time. It's about what there are only a few languages that are actually what I would call super languages that are capable of talking about everything. Most languages are micro languages. Okay. So if you look at Anglo-Saxon. Um, before the influx of Latin, uh, before Alfred, you couldn't talk about theology and philosophy. You couldn't, they didn't have the means of doing this. And so what happened is the project of Alfred and his crew was to bring these things to that language. So they're coining words, they're using words in new ways, and it's enhancing the language so that it can talk about these things. Now, Latin itself went through that same process in um, the first and second centuries uh, BC. So um, uh, they, they conquered Greece. They conquered uh, Greece and they took all these Greek slaves and they felt kind of awkward because all these slaves that they had were way smarter than they were. <laughs> and they didn't like that. And so they start very quickly trying to be like, oh, you guys are kind of good at art. Mm, maybe we should get good at art. And you guys are really good at um, writing plays and, and doing philosophy and all that. And so, uh, for example, we've, uh, if you look at Cicero, Cicero, after the death of his daughter, turned to philosophy, and his project was to take the philosophical terms of the Greeks and bring them to the Romans. And so he's coining new words and, and changing Latin to be able to talk about those things. Now, if he hadn't done that, um, Latin wouldn't have been ready for the Christian apologists to actually talk about Christian theology um, in the first few centuries AD. So it's a matter of whether the language is appropriate. So pre-Alfred, Anglo-Saxon was not, it was great for talking about certain things, okay? And the thing is, there's many beautiful things about a simple language, but that doesn't mean that it's sufficient um, to talk about everything you want to talk about. And what I mean when I say English is in decline and it's returning is that um, it is, it's, losing, um, it's losing that structural complexity that allowed it to do the things that it did. And you can see that so clearly in that we are having trouble reading our own literature. Okay, There's no getting around it. We have trouble reading our own literature, and that means that we're in a different place than they um, than they were a few even a few decades ago. Okay, good. Anything else? Uh, let's see. Yes. Uh, 
Well, um, so, I mean, we're talking about social studies here. So someone made an experiment and was able to come up with a certain result. And then somebody else tried to repeat that same experiment and wasn't able to do it. That doesn't really mean much about the argument itself. It just means that whatever that guy's argument was, was, was difficult to prove. And in reality, when you're talking about the complexity of languages, it is always really, really difficult to prove these things through social studies, okay? Why? Because there's too many factors, okay? Scientific method is amazing at working with physics because you're dealing with simple, uh, a, you can narrow things down to a few principles and you can test them. But when you're dealing with something like language, it's very, very complicated. So how do you see this? Well, um, you, you see this all the time, okay? If, uh, if you're reading original language, and I, I don't know how many, this has probably happened to you guys, you know, even, in, um, even if you're just in your freshman year working through something like Lingua Latina, you can read through a text and you can laugh and be like, that's hilarious, I love this, or that was beautiful. And then you kind of turn to somebody else and try to translate it, and the whole thing just kind of flubs, okay? And the reason why that is, is because it is particularly the way in which it's formed that makes it compelling in whatever way it is. And uh, particularly once you get into Virgil um, and Apuleius, you see this. So nobody's ever translated um, Apuleius in such a way that people wanted to read the translation. It's never been popular, okay? Um, and yet when you read it in Latin, it is, it's zany, it's crazy, it is super entertaining. Um, and if you can understand, if you can understand it, it's, um, it's, it's a real experience. But once you translate into English, it goes away. Another author that's like that is Horace, okay? How many guys have read Horace in translation? Really? Okay. Well, in my experience, horse and translation doesn't even make any sense. Like, I can't even figure out what, what it's saying at all. And there's something about the shape of his ideas where they do make sense in Latin, but when converted into English, they, they almost seem nonsensical, not just not compelling. And I, I think that um, if you look at certain authors, uh, Homer's a great example. Homer's ideas translate very, very well into English. And it's just for whatever reason, his, uh, you know, some authors will come over well and some won't. But that's an illustration of the difference of shapes uh, of thoughts. Okay? Uh, good. Uh, yes, Nathan? Are there any reasons for classical language study that people have stopped giving? Oh, yeah, well. <laughs> um, so uh, there are a lot of arguments. I think what I, I understand what you're saying. There are a lot of arguments that I think are very harmful. Um, so one of them, there's this, this, this uh, um, actually, I don't think I'll say anything about this, I'm on tape. So um, <laughs> theoretically, there might be some arguments out there um, that <laughs> where it's like, there's only one reason to learn Latin. It's because it's beautiful. It's beautiful, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. This is the only reason. And if you're not reading the original text, if you don't get to the point where you're reading the original text like a newspaper, then you've wasted all your time. And that's harmful. It's also just not true at all. Um, so uh, most of you here are much better at Latin than I am at Greek, okay? And I have reaped many, many benefits from my study of Greek even though I only made it a little bit of the way before I got too busy, okay? There's always retirement. I'm hoping to get there in Greek too. But the point is, um, there are many benefits. So as soon as you jump into the language and you start learning how to think differently, you are experiencing benefits. Um, and it's gonna help you become a better reader of ancient literature in general. So I feel like some of those arguments where they say, no, if you're not going to original languages, if you're not getting all the way there, then you wasted all your time. That's baloney. Okay, all right. Yes. Do you have a recommended best language direction to take for NSA students, like only taking one or two languages at the time that you're trying to get as many languages as possible? Right. 
So I think in general, um, uh, it's better to get maybe two, two languages really uh, do them well um, instead of trying to get them all in unless you're just using all your elective time. But in general, you just need to figure out um, what you're interested in doing first. If you're really into literature, Latin and Greek make the most sense. If you want to get into the biblical languages, you need to get into Hebrew as quick as possible um, and Greek. So there you go. Well, we're out of time. And the last thing I'd ever want to do would be to prolong this experience for you. <laughs> so thank you very much. See you.